Good. Well, welcome. Welcome to the session. We'll be talking about open operations. That is some of these ideas that emerged during the work we were doing on Sovereign Cloud Stack. So that's the project that both Felix and I are working on. Um, and we are both working for the Open Source Business Alliance, which is actually the organization, a nonprofit organization from open source industry, uh, mostly in Germany, which uh, receives some funding from the federal government in Germany uh, to run this project. Um, with that, we'll just jump right in. This works. Uh, just, yeah, uh, probably you're probably aware of this. We will publish the slides also if you want to have the PDFs on our website, which we do with most of the, the presentations we give. And of course, there's the recording, which uh, can be watched as well. Okay. And with that, it's my pleasure to actually introduce my colleague Kurt. Kurt has a long history with open source. As you can see from all the logos, he's been a long-term contributor to various projects. And um, initially studied physics, and uh, we both work on SCS. Uh, I joined that project in February. And uh, Kurt has worked at SUSE and is uh, the one who's initially responsible for the Open Telecom Cloud and built that. And um, aside from that, you see he has been active for a long, long time. He's very passionate about open source. And actually, my personal best fact about Kurt is that he's one of those tech guys that actually think outside the box. So it actually makes a lot of fun to discuss with him things that are not only technical, but all sorts of other things which is also why he qualifies to actually hold a talk like this about open operations. It's not purely technical. Yeah. Well, I guess some people call me opinionated, but that's, that's fine. That's what I like about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, my pleasure to introduce uh, Felix. He got infected, actually, with open source in 98-ish, I guess. Um, went to this big Linux World Expo 99 in San Jose, which then finally got him, and then long-term contributor to OpenBSD, also Open Darwin, until that somehow got a bit disrupted by actions. Spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> by actions from an unnamed company. Um, he was then founding Vitemine. That was an open source company, infrastructure company, uh, which he, well, ran for a number of years and then also stayed with, uh, within the team for, for quite some more time. He's been working for Gridscale for a number of years now, also been in the um, board of the Open Source Business Alliance for, for many, many years. Um, and actually, when we started this project and um, decided that we would do it inside of the Open Source Business Alliance, he was one of those people really supporting it. And actually, I'm happy he's now always working directly on Sovereign Cloud Stack as the product owner of the infrastructure and operation teams, which is great. And uh, a small side note, for, so for me, this is the first uh, summit of the Open Infra Foundation. Kurt, I'm sure many know him, since he's also a member of the board at the Open Infra Foundation. But for me, actually, all the OpenStack stuff is fairly new, since uh, so far, where I worked, uh, we did not use uh, OpenStack. So I'm really happy to be here and uh, also meet lots of faces from the community. And without further ado, Kurt, why don't you start? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's definitely, and it's a great summit. I mean, I've been to, yes, a number of them. 2012 was the first one in San Francisco. Um, so just maybe quickly looking back while we're talking about open operations. And I want to look back at what, what we did with open source when we started. I started in 94 when I got this Linux infection. Um, and then eventually actually got to work with some very smart people that were the ones that actually created Linux, um, which was fun. And I, I think at the time, a lot of us had this feeling like, um, while this IT thing is really becoming larger and bigger and more important, and it starts to control our life. And we wanted to make sure there's, there's at least on our own machines we have some level of control of what's running there and what's happening there. And uh, I guess some of us were hoping that maybe what we are doing does not just help ourselves, but maybe there's others that can find that stuff useful and do it. But it was this, this David uh, versus Goliath feeling that we certainly had uh, compared to this uh, large proprietary operating systems out there that kind of defined the market. That was 95. Hobbyists that kind of tried to solve their own problems and started and learned how to collaborate to do it, to do a bit more in a team than alone. 2020, things is, of course, the world is different. So we have open source everywhere. Um, I think almost nothing of the IT infrastructure we use these days would work without open source. 
Um, internet, TVs, smartphones, routers, cars. Um, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So we should, I guess we should celebrate and say everything's great. And unfortunately, it's not. <laughs> I mean, there's a, a lot of great things actually. Is not, there's, there's a lot of companies. We have a lot of people that actually are paid for working on open source. We have companies that have created business models that work. Uh, most people these days that do work on important projects actually get get a paycheck for doing that, which is which is great. But not everything's great. And there's one thing I, I really noticed. There was like a time when every other week there was an announcement about some great new open something project. And when I looked at that, I really got annoyed because they used this open term. And when I looked at that, the only thing I saw was a closed door. It was not open. Maybe some part of the code was uh, open source. Maybe not even that. Uh, maybe it was an open core model. Uh, or maybe it was open according to some very strange definition of open. It's not even an OSI compliant open source license. So, um, and I think we still, as an open source community, need to be very careful when somebody is um, pushing something out as open. Please look twice, make sure it really is open source. And uh, sim similar discussion with transparency. I mean, uh, the, the picture I chose for this is uh, like those blinded pictures where you can easily look outside, but you cannot look from the outside in. Um, so transparency really always needs to be dope both ways to, to be valuable. Um, the community we're part of, the open infrastructure community, of course, um, has seen this. Um, and we talk a lot about these four opens in the open infrastructure community. And I think that's really important because in the end, when we say open source in the open infrastructure community, it is not, well, it, it is the license. And when we say open source, it's not just like an open core model. When we say all the software needs to be fully open source. And then, of course, that's not as helpful if you have projects that you would like to, to contribute to, because that's what open source projects, after all, are useful to. Um, and then there's no way to actually contribute, to become part of that community, to um, insert your ideas, code, contributions into the development process. So you really need to have an open development process in an open community where the design is worked on in an open way so it can be contributed to and you can understand how decisions are being taken uh, and how you can maybe influence those decisions or become part of the decision making process. So that is, that is what really open means to me and I fully, I fully subscribe to the four opens that we have there. So I think we got that one squared away. So with that one squared away we should have one or maybe we haven't. I mean, we should have one. We should have this wonderful world of everybody building their infrastructure based on open source software, having these nice little clouds out there that work together. Uh, when users have needs, they can find one of these clouds, one of these sheep on the picture, and uh, get their needs being serviced. And the reality we see actually is we have a small number of very large providers um, that dominate the market. And when you choose one of them, it's actually very hard to change, to get away from that and use another provider or start building your own and get control of your infrastructure. So that's the reality. And how could that happen is the question I'm asking. And um, we should have solved the problem. So we have open source, which allows us to collaborate on software. But in the end, today's infrastructure may have, may, maybe it's a bit more difficult than the operating systems we built 20 years ago when we started with Linux. Um, we need not like making one project successful, but we need to compose infrastructure. In order to have a modern IT platform with cloud container infrastructure, you need to compose hundreds of projects in a consistent way to make sure things work. And that's probably more difficult and we probably need more collaboration than we've had before to create an operating system. So we are working on that. 
um, trying to make sure that we have all the projects we need, make sure everybody observes the four opens, make sure we then establish the collaboration across them. And then obviously deal with the complexity of, of having distributed um, dynamic infrastructure. And that's something, I mean, we need to just be aware. It's just very, very difficult and hard problem. And um, it needs a lot of collaboration and it, need, it needs a lot of skills. Um, this picture actually I stole from a um, keynote in, in Texas uh, from the Open Infrastructure Summit. Uh, where a company tried to understand the flows. So this is, this is five or six years old. Um, but uh, I, I still think it's a good illustration of the complexity of just, just OpenStack. And you need more than OpenStack in order to build modern infrastructure. Um, and then, once you've built that, which is hard enough, you need to operate it. And I've seen really good companies, large companies with skills teams that have failed to operate cloud infrastructure. And um, there's a lot you need to learn before you can do that. You need, you need to learn, you need to find the right skills, people, you need to build the right things. So the one thing we have observed is we have learned that complex systems are best run in a DevOps manner where you start to tell, to have engineers that develop the platform to think about the operational aspects and you have the operational people actually have development skills to automate and solve all those problems. Now we have been very successful establishing this collaboration on the development side of things. We're looking at the operation things, not so much actually. So I think we are lacking on building structure, methodologies, ways that we share knowledge, that we work together, that we collaborate on the operation side. So this is what we want to discuss with you today. Here you see a quote from uh, the SCS website, where when we started, already claimed of where we want to go. And uh, I will quickly actually read it, despite I usually hate reading from slides, but I just really like that quote. By sharing and documenting best practices for operating such cloud stacks, the difficulty to provide high quality cloud service internally or publicly is vastly reduced. And by sharing and documenting best practices, we do not, do not mean internally, but actually throughout CSPs, collaborating on the CSP layers so that the operators actually share best practices with, with each other. And um, so we actually kind of started to think about hmm, maybe it's time to propose a fifth open to add to the four fantastic opens we already have, the paradigm of open operations. And um, of course, um, there are already many ways we address the operations challenge by having tooling that we share, that we publish, Ansible playbooks, dashboards that are shared on, on sites, that are shared in communities, with the SCS reference implementation, for example, we actually ship a whole bunch of them. And uh, for example, um, we have the OpenStack Health Monitor in the SCS project where we actually started to monitor in a behavior-based way from the outside clouds that are based upon SCS to actually make transparent how they perform. And I just used the word make transparent because we actually want to make it visible to the users how the cloud environment of an operator functions and performs to make it visible what the user and the customer gets. Yeah, maybe just adding to what you said. I mean, this, the tool can be used by the operations team of the cloud the same way that actually users, just tenant users without any privileges, can use it to see the status of the cloud. So we can, we can use that to monitor SCS environments if you like. If those environments like to be monitored. We, we wouldn't even need to ask them for permissions. Exactly. We do. We are friendly. <laughs> we, we do. We um, don't want to pay this, whatever, 50 euro resource cost. OK. Uh, and uh, also, there will be a talk tomorrow um, by Matthias and me on observability on OpenStack, where we're also going to dive into that a bit more. But now, let's stick f with the open operations. So is open sourcing the tools enough? And I actually say, no, that's, that's not what actually cuts the whole deal. 
Because if you actually look at modern cloud environments, and if you remember the keynotes from this morning, developing software and sharing software is only part of the game. So what actually goes into that whole game is people as well as processes. And if you, if you look at the image, basically while tools, and we all love tools, are important, they are basically the icing to the cake. If you don't have the people and if you don't have the culture, all tools will be useless. Well, mostly. And um, on top of that come the processes. And basically, um, this is what I call the iceberg effect. Um, thanks to Tasha for actually visualizing it in a nice way. Because often, if we are among communities, we talk about tools. Because it's much easier to obsess over tools than over culture and actually dive into problems of culture and be transparent about culture as well as processes. I mean, I'm very sure some of you can already tell a story about how they tried to actually open up about their processes and were not allowed because of some confidentiality issues or some other stuff, or maybe because the processes were just broken and one doesn't want to talk about broken processes. So with that, I want to dive into the subject of psychological safety for the, basically in the people layer. And uh, there is a really, really good book um, called The Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson of Harvard Business School. And in the book, Fearless Organization, she actually made a few case studies, not in IT, but in other industries. And the one example I want to talk about is actually from a hospital where she analyzed various emergency room teams. And it was apparent from her case study that actually teams that reported more errors were actually more effective. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that better teams don't make more mistakes. They are just more likely to learn from them. And that's actually one very important lesson is basically errors are the best source of learning. And it's important to actually start developing a healthy error culture because without having a healthy error culture within the organization or the company, you will not be able to do good root cause analysis. Um, in order to actually have a good root cause analysis, you need to have the mindset in the organization to be open about errors, to actually be allowed to talk about errors and admit them. And that is actually a good way to then go to the next level if you actually have internally the right mindset to go for public root cause analysis. And Kurt provided these two examples. Um, do you want to say a bit more about those? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just the idea you just gave us that having the right error culture to learn from it. I mean, what if you allow others to learn from your errors as well? So overall, as an industry or as a group, you get better. Um, I was watching, obviously, the IT space always and looked at companies and looked at what direction they take. So I think it was the, the early 2010s when I was really counting Microsoft off. I saw their not very impressive Hyper-V technology. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the Azure stack and I thought, well, okay, I don't think they are very competitive. And then maybe a year or two later, I saw um, a root cause analysis report from Microsoft about an outage they had on uh, February 29th of 2012. Um, the exact date is not a coincidence because it had to do with the leap day. And they had really written down all the different things that went wrong in the infrastructure and just reported about it publicly and how they analyzed that and how they struggled and how some safety measures they had in there didn't work the way they should have worked. Um, and I, I was deeply impressed. I was also thinking, oh shit, we need to take Microsoft seriously again. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I mean, I, I, and I, I, I'm not sure I told this to my uh, Open Telecom Cloud friends uh, when I wrote the, the public root cause analysis on our network outage in 2017. I was inspired by Microsoft, so sorry. Um, but yes, I think, I think in the end, uh, we as a team were stronger, and I think that customers that took the time to, to understand what went wrong and also learned how we took this seriously and how we improved and learned from that had more trust into us than they had before. So yeah. I think that that is something that does help. Yeah. Where, wherever I actually build up operations teams, 
I like to actually quote an OpenBSD developer or former OpenBSD developer, Art Grabowski from Sweden. And uh, he actually said early 2000s, only failures make us experts. And that's a very simple statement that I've been carrying with me ever since because it's such a good statement because it just tells everything. So, and um, just one important note, the, basically as we go down the stack from tools to processes to people, the more controversial it actually gets. Quickly, let's glance at the processes. Um, in preparation for this talk, and we have been talking a lot about processes, um, I just wanted to make sure to have one definition of processes in place. So if I talk processes, I don't mean railway tracks. I mean actually um, rail guards, like on an autobahn, that keep you in the lane, but that don't tie you down to exact behavior. Because basically good processes allow for some flexibility, but that guide you actually through the process. And if I was searching for good examples of open processes, and um, one I found was uh, GitLab, probably known to quite a few of you. They basically opened up almost everything in their handbook that's publicly available. And um, I would just recommend go read through it. It's an inspiration. And um, if we give this talk again, I would love to have an example from here that we can also link on the slide. Another step in the right direction, I'm sure everyone is aware of the site reliability engineering movement that started uh, a few years ago. And uh, Google actually um, put out a few books uh, on site reliability engineering that are also publicly available, so follow that link. Um, I've never worked at Google, so I'm, I cannot judge whether the content they published matches what's lived. I assume to a fair degree, um, but that's also a very, very good, good example. And um, important is that uh, in order to, for us all to be successful is share knowledge, share status, share challenges, and uh, write good pu public root cause analysis. And uh, for example, status pages, uh, we are actually in the SDS project with a few CSP just started a debate on what a good status page should actually feature and what it uh, should offer also for the operators. And, um, Actually, having a status page that transparently reports all your stuff is really valuable, and it builds trust. Into, but in, it builds trust by, for the users to actually that they know when there's really something up, you are going to tell them, and uh, that's not uh, to underestimate. So, Kurt, do you want to have a few more words about SCS? Yes. So, I mean. The, the reason we're talking about open operations is because we really need it for sovereign cloud stack to be successful. Because if we just um, work with providers, existing ones, upcoming ones, to, to standardize and build the infrastructure, we still have a too high hurdle for them to be successful if we don't make progress on the operations topic. And that's why we're really building this open operations community with the with the community that's working with us, with providers mostly, um, to, to overcome some of that and share, share the learning and allow to learn from each other and not start from scratch whenever a new, a new community member joins the provider crowd. So that's, that's how we want to make it sustainable. Um, we have a few folks um, that uh, are part of this project, uh, full-time employed by the Open Source Business Alliance. We're still looking for great talent, so if you're interested, <laughs> Please come talk to us. We're hiring. Uh, like, I know everybody It's a small court. Nobody like everybody sees has, it. Okay, maybe I should have one, one slide uh, on this. Um, but yes, but of course, also just participating in a community, contributing is very valuable for us. And uh, overall, I mean, working on digital sovereignty, having platforms that can be influenced, that can be developed the way you need them is what we want to make easier to achieve. I want to close with, uh, I guess we should always close with a call to, ac to action, so please join us. That's the call to action. There's a few things you can do, become part of our community, but I also want to make you aware of the Operate First initiatives. That is not exactly the same as open operations, but we, we share a fair amount of common themes and discussions, so we're also closely linked with them. We'll have a forum session tomorrow morning on open operations where we can definitely have 
a lot more discussions than we probably can do in the last like two minutes or so. Um, and there's a few other presentations like the observability topic that uh, Felix will talk about, which kind of help with the, the operations topic. Um, so yes, please, please join us and please have discussions. Do we have time for a few questions? I hope we do. Let's just, if nobody stops us, we do. Well, questions, feedback, remarks, whatever. Absolutely, we are open to input. Do it. I think we're supposed to bring them a microphone. Um, it was there somewhere. was one. Um, otherwise, I'll just repeat the question. Okay, I'll repeat the question. So it was the uh, observation that uh, there's been a lot of debate on root cause analysis, but maybe the, the wording is wrong because there typically is not a single root cause that caused the whole issue, but really a chain of events. Well, um, well there's also the other term, blameless post-mortem, um, which is also, a, also not liked by everyone because the term post-mortem is not really nice. Um, I, I actually agree um, to a certain degree that there's not always a single root cause. Um, there is also a fantastic article on the net, I don't have it here, but I can look it up, on why using the 5Y te technique is not the best way to do root cause analysis, which also dives into exactly what you just said, that there might not be a single root cause. And by, by focusing on trying to find a single root cause, you might neglect other facts that are played into it. So, um, yes, I agree. Um, so, we can just call it um, cause analysis. <laughs> but ba ba basically, the idea stays the same. The, the idea stays the same that um, you need to be open to your own mistakes and actually dive into those. Yeah, I, I would say if, if a single thing caused all those failures, then your, your architecture probably was not very yeah. strong. So, it's always, it's always a chain of events. And, I guess we still call it root cause analysis because that's how it's been called always. Um, but yes, if you do it well, I mean, you really work your way through that complete chain and make that complete chain transparent. Then at every single step, you check how can I improve to, to avoid this repeating. Um, but I, if you look at the two examples, I think both are good examples where the complete chains have been made transparent. Um, also, another call to action. If you have any further input on these subjects, please hit me outside and then... I I will get that and uh, add it, because um, we are always looking for good examples. Another question there? Is this working? It is working. It's work it is working. OK, perfect. Um, you also mentioned um, open operations. And uh, I think, to, to what degree do you think this is more or less yeah, science fiction or uh, best wishing? Because, I mean, if, for example, if you look at the CSPs, and they really share about how they operate their networks, especially in open RAN and so forth. They're giving away a key element, uh, a key competitive element to other competitors. So how would you envision, other than in, I would say, uh, standardization bodies, how would you envision open operations to really work to the benefit of everybody? Yeah. So I, I mean, that's, that's obviously the, the standard uh, um, question that we do get. and. Um, I, I would not claim that there's like the, the one complete answer to that. Um, I could, of course, also say that like when 20 years ago we started talking open source that we got the same thinking that uh, why would companies start to share their software? Um, I think we, we need to kind of have that discussion. What do companies do in order to differentiate with their competitors? Um, and is that really the details how you operate certain aspects of your infrastructure? Or is it other services which are a lot closer to your customer where you support your customer in bringing his applications to a cloud native platform and, and get them to work better? So that's, that's kind of one question I would ask. Um, the other point is, I mean, we are trying to establish an alternative to the large 
hyperscalers out there. Um, if we're doing this well, or I should, do it, I should say it differently, we can only succeed if we do it well. And we will not do it well if like a number of companies just say, try to be the, the single company that tries to become the alternative. If we don't work together, we'll never be strong enough to be viable as an alternative. So it's not a zero sum game. Actually, if you build a really open infrastructure and you do that together with, with others that want to do the same, the ecosystem will grow a lot more than you might lose by sharing some information that might help your competitor to be a bit better. Because it's, it's not really your competitor. I mean, you're building an ecosystem together. And yes, some customers may move between you. And that's an advantage for the customers because having that freedom to actually learn that it's better to be in an open ecosystem than to be bound to a single lock-in infrastructure. Want to add? Well, well I, w I was just about to say that is operations really the secret sauce that will make the difference or whether those differences are not others like, like for example, excellent customer support and things like those or superior performance because uh, you all use the same stuff to build it, but you basically just use better hardware or whatever. So I think it's actually, and, and also in, in collaborating in these kind of things, uh, there is actually a chance to uh, go after the big fish that those are the hyperscales and actually get those customers. There's another question. I think in order to learn from errors, you don't have to make them by yourself. You can <laughs> That's learn also from, very true. <laughs> you can learn from <laughs> errors which other ones already have made. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I tell my kids all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so you, 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 you don't have to, to make every error by yourself. That is one thing. And about 20 years ago in Germany, we had such a funny thing. I know the German word, and I don't know how well to translate it. It was Arbeitskreis, yeah, yeah, between different companies. And exactly that happens there, you know. You learn, you did exchange the information, and you learn from experience and errors other ones make. I, I would like to pick that up and, real quick. And then, you know, in the time frame of outsourcing and cost optimization and everything, that was all cancelled, and that was definitely wrong. Yeah, but you, you just used the term Arbeitskreis, which is basically working group. Yeah. And, um, and just... We, well, we are beyond limits anyways, but, um, <laughs> but uh, quickly, um, so basically the working groups we have in, in SCS, for example, the special interest group monitoring that we are going to talk about tomorrow in, the, in that other talk, that's exactly a group comprom comprised of several CSPs where we share how do we do observability. And by that, each and every one brings something in and takes something back and all of us get better. And that's exactly that. I the think only thing is what I want to say, it's not a new invention. It we're, we're not was claiming 20 to, years ago. No, we're not claiming it to be new. <laughs> so, last question here. Additions, I think so. Um, well, I think it's a change of culture. You must be more open for some things. In the most cases, um, CSPs are, have an incident as special, or dashboards uh, represented what issues can be. And I think it's a change of um, culture that must be to really communicate failures. And I think for open operation, it's a good point to um, the first point to documentate issues and how the operations works. In the most cases, every company has their own documentation, but why not a documentation which is a standard work? Well, Matthias, I think that's good closing words, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, indeed. I mean, if you don't have a culture where you can talk about mistakes because, well, the theory is there are no mistakes possible. Um, you will not have open operations. Yes. Well, with that, thanks for listening and be here. Thank you.